Father, we just come before you for our grace and we thank you for this evening. We're looking forward to what you'll say to us. Lord, give us ears to hear. Cause our hearts, O oh God, to move in agreement with your word and be one accord with your saying to us. And let your spirit, O oh God, have his work in our life, do his work in our life. We permit him to change, O oh God, our minds, Lord, and to truly to the mind of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're showing us in this final hour. Let your fires continue to purify us. O oh God, intensify within us, O oh God, the love for you, or desire for you. Cause, O oh God, your loveliness, O oh God, to be our desire. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go back to the book of Romans. We're talking this morning in the ninth chapter. And time ran out on us. And we're mostly looking at verses 12 and verse 13. This will be videotape number 16 and also cassette tape number 16. This will be the fourth week of my Bible school session. There's two more weeks after this one, and then we'll have a long break until late August or early September. We'll have a chance to go back over all these lessons. Is that wonderful? And so in this ninth chapter of Romans, let's pick back up at verse 12. Let's begin at verse, I'll tell you what, let's begin at verse uh, 06. Let's begin there, because that we will bring it on to one thought and one conclusion. So God is here telling us through Brother Paul, we've already gone through the first eight chapters, which you might say sort of serve as an introduction to the book of Romans. He began first with a rebuke, and then he began to lay again the elementary principles of what it meant to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that, after he went on showing us about faith and grace and the power of God, the compassion of our God to die for us, he told us, don't walk in guilt and condemnation. He talked about working out his salvation, how difficult it was sometimes, and he began to fight against it. And Mary Magdalene would let to see you. How are you doing? We just stand with you in Jesus' name. Stand with you in Jesus' name. We curse this thing that's attaching, uh, trying to attach itself to you in Jesus' name. We see what the word of faith says, not what your body says. Amen. And so, he told us, he said, you know, I'm fighting this struggle. I'm fighting against the powers of darkness in my flesh. He said, the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. But he wasn't making an excuse. He even complained about it. He said, I'm a wretched man. But he spoke faith. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ shall surely deliver from this body of death. Amen. And now he begins to tell us about those that are religious, the Israelites, who are his kinsmen, according to flesh. And he's in grief. He's in great sorrow. And he says to us very clearly that God gave these Israelites the adoption of his son the glory and the covenants. He gave them, he said very clearly, the law, the temple services, and all the promises. It's amazing how God will present to all of us his promises. Each and every one of us are given the same equal opportunity to believe and to receive and to exercise our faith in the promises of God. There's a promise in the word of God that's not for us. But we, uh, we've all learned so much in, uh, in this warfare of salvation that the power of darkness, friendships, and everything else does everything in its power to cause us to have doubt of what God says. There's no reason we should ever doubt anything that God says. God has spoken. And the Bible has already said to us about his character, it is impossible for God to lie. He said, a man, and he should lie. Amen? Amen? And so he's telling us all these things, how God had provided to make provision for his people. Yet these people who had the word of God had their fill of it. They were trained for little children to memorize the first five books of the Bible were trained to do that. They knew their history. They knew the history of God and how he'd worked with them as a people. They were given the responsibility to carry out certain celebrations and certain festivals so they would never forget the awesome power of God and how he displayed his power and his strength, his full wrath against Pharaoh to deliver them out of bondage just because they had continued to cry out and God had heard their groanings and their moanings. <laughs> And Paul gives us a revelation about how they had all these wonderful benefits. And yet they were never able to possess these benefits. And you will also learn that they walked into a sense of pride and self-righteousness because of the God, God's choice of them. Listen to what he says in verse 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed. Then he says something to us. He says, for they are not all descendants who are descendant from Abraham. And we saw this morning... Session 14 and session 15. That when we come to the spiritual things of God, there's not one son that's born spiritually. There are two sons. One is born of the flesh, and therefore he goes after the flesh. 
what is born of the spirit, and therefore he goes and he minds the things of the spirit. The Lord has already said to us, to be currently minded is death. He's already said to us through Paul's revelation in Philippians, the third chapter, those who set their minds on the things of this life, he says they are enemies of the cross. He said, and many will choose to walk that path. Jesus called it the broad way. When the Bible talks about the things of the broad way, the wicked and all these things, contrary to what you've been told by the doctrines of religion, never once is it talking about those of the world who have never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord, but in every sense of the word, it's talking about those who profess with their mouths, they know God, they love God, they desire God. But yet the Bible says very clearly in Titus 1.16, they profess to know him about their deeds, they deny him. And so these are sons of the flesh. And so he said to us, Abraham will have many sons, many sons, but there's only a remnant that shall be saved. And so that's what he's talking about here. He's beginning to address these people of God, supposedly, the Israelites, the Jews, and he's saying to them, in a very sarcastic type of way, you're not the sons of God. You're sons of the flesh. And so he says to us, to make us understand this, verse 6 is such an important truth. Now, if you're one of those that thought that the Jews were still God's chosen people and all this, I can guarantee the word of truth is hammered against that which you were calling truth. You've forgotten something. And when Christ has come, something took place. It caught their attention. That was a veil that was written to. You've forgotten something. What Paul said to us in Ephesians. He said very clearly, both bodies, he's now made into one new man. Is that right? He said to us very clearly that there's neither no more Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female, for all now one in Christ Jesus. Is that right? You've forgotten those things. And when you're holding on to something that is false and you're practicing because you were told it was light, then the word of God becomes to you, no matter what scriptures you look at, something that you find yourself rebelling against. And that's what the Jews did. That's exactly what they did. Jesus said to them, because you don't recognize every visitation, how often I want to gather you. The way he says, a hen gathers her chicks, but you were unwilling, and now your house is being left to you desolate. That's exactly right. We saw this morning very clearly in the fourth chapter of Galatians. Paul said that Jerusalem, present-day Jerusalem, is in bondage with her children, corresponds to Mount Sinai in Arabia, a desert place. You know, you know and I know that Jerusalem is not in Arabia, is it? But that's what he said. He's telling us that spiritually they're dead. They're in a desert place. They're in the same place that the powers of darkness are. Whenever you tell about the Lord Jesus Christ and he casts out demons, he commands them to go to the dry place, the place where there's no water, the place where there's no life. When you read about Joel's army, the demon powers couldn't come in until the water was shut off. No water. Then when you read when the demon powers came in, God said to his people, humble yourself and pray, and say, spare thy people, O God, and give not thy heritage to reproach. He said, Lord, will be what zealous, zealous for his land. Is that right? And he said to us, and I will drive off the northern army off your land into the what places? Into the dry places. The demon powers are always cast into the dry places. The sons of God that claim they love God, <laughs> but they got the flesh, they're also driven out into the dry places. Quite interesting, isn't it? And so Paul gave us a revelation in the sixth chapter of Galatians. He said to us, there's two Israels. But the Israel that God is working with today is a spiritual Israel, and it's none other than the body of the Lord Jesus Christ who followed the Lamb of God wherever he goes. Can you say amen? amen. He said, Jerusalem above is our mother. She's free. In Hebrews 12, he said the very same thing. You didn't come to a place of law, a mountain to be touched, he said, or to thunder, and a sound that was so hard they begged that no further word be given to them. And they couldn't bear the command, you shouldn't even touch the mountain. If a beast even touched it, was killed and slain. He said, but you've come where? To Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem, the marriage of angels, where the spiritual righteous men make perfect. You come to Jesus, the medium of a new covenant, and a sprinkle of blood that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. He kept telling us in every book. But then we begin to act like the other sons. And so Paul is now writing to us. In fact, Romans, you might say, is the heart and the root of every other revelation that Paul writes about. It's a wonderful book. Oh, did God give him a revelation? Can you say amen to that? <laughs> and now he explains it to us. Now you think about these words. He says, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And then he goes even farther. He says, that is, 
It is not, well, that's amazing. It is not the children of the flesh. It is not the children of the words that are fleshly minded. The children of the flesh are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. He says in verse 7, neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, that means God had given a promise. And you see, just like he said, he watches over his word to perform it. Isaac was a promise. Isaac was the word of God being fulfilled. His name alone gives us the joy of the Lord, laughter. Ha, ha, ha. God had promised him he'd have laughter in his old age. Joy to be fulfilled. And God said to him, now through him, he said, will your seed come? And we saw that. We saw it fulfilled. And we, we discovered two sons, Jacob and Esau. And we saw this morning something, that God, before he formed the world, knew you. Before you were ever born, he knew you. He even ordered how many days you live in this earth, in this test tube we call the world. This world of lies. Everything in this world is an absolute lie. Only what God says is truth. And he ordered our days. He even saw ahead even those that were praying and said, Oh God, give me an extension of my life. He made provision for that. There was nothing that he did not fulfill in his perfect divine order. And so he says to us, <laughs> Verse 9, for this is a word of promise. At this time I will come, several shall have a son. A word of promise. He watches over his promises, doesn't he? And not only this, but there was also Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man. Our father Isaac, he said this thing to us, there's one father. There's two different natures. There's two different sons. And they all call themselves Christians. We, I talked very light this morning about the parable of the Lord talking about the gospel that goes out as a great net and goes into the sea. The sea means sea of people. The net's always going forth into a sea of people. The gospel, the word of God, the power of God for salvation to those who choose to believe. Free will, choice, choose to believe. I said before you, death and life, choose life, he says. Amen. The angels bring it to the shore. Ha ha. That means a place where they can work on them. And begin to separate them. It takes the good and put them in containers so they won't be spoiled. But the bad they throw away. That's what's happening right now. We have been gathered to the shore, glory to God. And God is beginning to inspect us. And it's going on to inspect them, angels. And the ones that are holding on to their lives, they'll be cast away. But the ones that's clinging to Jesus, like Jacob of old, saying, Lord, I won't turn you loose till you bless me. Acts 3 26. He blesses us by turning us from our evil, wicked ways. <laughs> and so we're learning something. In this great sea of all those who claim to be believers, that will be a separation process to take place. It's always been prophesied. He said in one place, I will come and judge between sheep and sheep. One place he says between sheep and goats. All talking about those in his kingdom. Are you listening to me? This is what he says. In verse 11, because he's God, I'll remind you again what he said to us very clearly in Isaiah 46, 10. I am God, and I already know the end from the beginning. I know everything that's going to happen. God knew everything that you did when you left here the first session today. He already knew what you were going to do. You didn't know, but he already knew. He knows when you leave here tonight what you're going to do. He's God. There's not one thing you can do or even think about that God hasn't already known you were going to do it. That's why David said it first and then Solomon copied, I can go to the highest mountain, you're there. I go to the hell, you're there. There's no place you're not. You take a flight and run to the end of the world, guess what? He's there too. He's God. He is so awesome. I remember that he said to me when I was having a problem with faith, Praying to God, saying, I wonder when is my number going to come up 
as if I was standing in line for God to answer. He said, I'm God, and I can hear all prayers at one time if every human being was praying on the earth at one time, and because I am God, I am able to answer all of them at one time. So I got set free from that demon telling me God hasn't had a chance to get around to you yet. You guys probably don't think like that, do you? You probably already knew that, did you? Maybe come to verse 11. For though the two sons would not get born, had not done anything, good or bad, but in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, not because of something they did or earned, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. We saw that fulfilled in Genesis 25, 23. And how did God know that? Because of Isaiah 46, 10. Just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. We saw in Malachi 1, 1 through 4, that, that Esau would have an attitude, you can tear me down, but I'll rebuild. And God told us very clearly in Malachi, they will call them the people whom God is indignant against forever, and they shall be known as the wicked territory. Did we see that this morning? Anybody need to see it again? Oh. All right. Go to Malachi 1. And we'll look at Habakkuk a little bit to bring you up to date. And by the way, before you leave, stop and get tape number 14 and 15. <laughs> Malachi 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Oracle means burden. It means that it's it is a rushing of the Holy Ghost from within a man's bosom or chest or belly. And if he doesn't share this word that God's given to him, he'll burst like a good old bottle of wine. I'm not saying that wine is good, but you get the point. Maybe I should say a bad bottle of wine. That'd be better. We don't drink wine, do we? But you know what I'm talking about? You'll feel like you're going to burst if you hold it in. It's a burden. It's a weight. You've got to get rid of it. How do you do it? You open your mouth and say what thus says the Lord. Some people call it bearing your soul. Here's the word God gave him. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how has I loved us? Then God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. But I have hated Esau. Why? Because God saw and knew everything he'd ever do before he was ever formed. I have made his mountains, that means his kingdoms, a desolation. And appointed his inheritance for the demon powers. It's, it's called their jackals of the wilderness, desert places. The wilderness is always a desert place, a place of no life, a place of intense heat. Then he begins to call him by his covenant name. Esau sold his birthright, his salvation, his eternal reward for a bowl of beans, lentils. And we're tested every day by the temptation that to walk through this earth to sell our birthright. And it hasn't hit us yet as a people of God. But we need a soberness to know how easy it is to sell our birthright. And when Esau sold his birthright, he didn't even recognize what he'd done. Do you know he thought he would still hold on to it? And that was why he went from this place into one of murder and rage against his brother Jacob and would have killed him. He was consoling himself, the Bible says. Because he was saying, I'll kill him. When dad is dead, I'll kill him. But the Holy Ghost told off on him. You don't find any place where a man heard him say it. He said it in his heart. And God heard him from his heart and went and told his mother. And gave her wisdom and direction to tell Jacob what to do. Before they were born, God had already chosen to see that Jacob got the birthright. That's why his name was called Jacob. What you were named, God ordained it before you were ever born. I know you thought your mother and daddy went through a little name book, didn't you? The Holy Ghost kept saying, pick that one. That's the one. That's the name. Right there. There it is. So they said, well, I guess we're naming John or Adam or Samuel or Louise or Teresa. You will look at them up. By the way, it means God selected. It's your call. It's your nature. Sometime we need a nature transplant. That's all right. And so God says in verse 4, though Edom says, oh, he's a braggart. We have been beaten down. 
but we will return and build the ruins. Thus says Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever, and your eyes will see this, and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Can you say amen? amen. The book of Obadiah, he saw before judgment comes, is very rich. It reminds me of the day, as I said this morning, the very repeating, I'm one of the new fad sayings and among those that teach prosperity is, how can these people attack us for teaching prosperity? We're going to laugh over to the bank. And they sit from pulpits. Well, you may laugh over to the bank, but God's going to tear you down. He's already prophesied it. The entire book of Obadiah is written to everyone that has a heart like Esau. He does this world, his prayer life consists of, give me, God bless my flesh, give me lots of money, give me lots of bucks, give me a big house, big cars, helicopters, plane yachts, Boats, trains, you, you name it. They have a list to God continuously from the earth for this world. Give me this kingdom of this world, oh God. Satan came and offered this to, to Jesus. Jesus turned it down. But they, Satan's offering to the church, and the church is lapping it up. God's going to do the same thing he did to them when they was in the wilderness. Fill them full of manna and begin to kill them. <coughs> so God says to Obadiah the prophet, we've heard a report from the Lord. God says, Behold, verse 2, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart, that was Esau's problem. Let me, let me ask you something else. Did you know that that was also what the Bible testifies to be the great sin of Solomon and Gomorrah? Had ease and abundance. Flesh. Flesh went berserk. This happened today. You, you who live in the clefts of the rocks, which means you thought you were in a secure place. Cleft of the rocks is a place of security, of rest, of peace, no anxiety. You're convinced that nothing can ever touch you there. We used to sing songs all the time about those who live in the cleft of the rocks, and he hides us in the cleft of the rock. In the waters of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who's going to bring me down to earth? God says, though you build her like an ego, though you set your nest among the stars, from there, I'll bring you down, declares the Lord. And he gives a comparison of a thief coming and robbing your house. Have anybody ever had their house broken into? Wait that You have? Did they leave you anything there? Or did they, they, they clean you out of all four walls? They took everything. Wow. You had some thieves, you had some thieves that operate like God operates. When God begins to destroy people, he don't leave a shred. And most things will leave something. They'll run in and don't want to be caught. And you walk in and you'll say, what's that hole doing there? My fish tank used to be there. Oh dear, look at the window that's knocked out. What else is missing? But you have some things left. But God is saying to Esau, when he's finished, there will be nothing left. In other words, he's saying this. They will never have a chance to repent. And the day of them having God's grace and salvation has ended. We're now approaching that day. He has risen up, and the door of salvation is beginning to close rapidly. God says, if thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you would be ruined. Would they not still only until they had enough? Yeah, that's usually true. A thief, he robs in fear usually, afraid of always being caught. If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, of course they would. I mean, what grape picker is that it says, oh, there's one on the ground, pick it up. No, he's quickly picking grapes. There's always a few left behind. But when God gets through, there's not going to be nothing left of Esau. And he begins to speak, and he says, oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasure search out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There's no understanding in him. Will I not on that day declare as Lord destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? That's why some of you are still fishing, and you're supposed to fish. He had promised, he said, I will send for many fishermen, they will fish for you from the rocks and the mountains and caves. Many fishermen, they'll be on the mountains, he said. Fish for them. Go after the ones you know that you feel still have a desire for God in their hearts where they're deceived in the prosperity camp. Go after them. By all means, go after them. 
But let me tell you, have you noticed how many you come against and they say to you, I just don't understand what you're talking about. God wants us blessed. He said, I'm going to destroy the understanding of the mountain of Esau. Then your mighty name will be displayed, O Teman, in order that everyone, everyone, may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Cause a vow to your brother Jacob. You'll be covered with shame. You'll be cut off forever, forever. Oh, Esau had already murdered him in his heart. It all well planned out. Then God says something to us. In verse 16, 15, on that day the Lord draws near on all the nations. Let me help you. God is so close to us folks that you almost can't help but breathe him in when you breathe. He's that close to us. If only you could understand. He has come among his people. He's here with us. For the, for the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealers will return on your own head. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, this word drank is not good. It means you got drunk with the wrong spirit in the presence of God. He's in his kingdom. All the nation will drink continually. They will, they will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape. And it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob become fire. A fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be a stubble. And they will set them on fire and consume them. The fire is the word of God. So that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Then those of the negative. That means that them there and those there are demon spirits he says will possess the mountain of Esau is it also in your Bible verse 21 then the deliverer will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau and the kingdom will be whose will be the Lord can you say amen to be sure to you again who these people are that God calls in the wrong camp in fact the third chapter God says very clearly to us Let's look at what it says in verse 18 and 19. Philippians 3, verse 18 and 19. Paul again gives us a revelation of many that shall be slain in God's kingdom. That was Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 18, verse 19. Paul writes by the Holy Ghost and he says for many walked that means that which you practice daily and that which has become normal and natural to you that's your walk not what you say with your lips but what you practice for many walk of, of whom I often tell you even weeping he says is what else he says that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, is that what uh, the Lord says to us? They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Then he says, whose end is destruction. Is that right? Whose God is our appetite, which means bellies, it says in King James, which means they only live to be satisfied with the things of this life and of this world. Then he says, who glory is in their shame. The interesting thing about that is, they don't know how to be shamed. You know that? They don't know how to be shamed. Who set their minds on what kind of things? Earthly. Earthly things. You're looking at the mountain of Esau. Now right next to the mountain of Esau is the mountain of Jacob, the overcomer. And that's what verse... 20 and 21 is talking about. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform 
the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things even unto himself. Is that in your Bible? Say with me. God is going to complete in me what he's begun in me. See, I want you to notice that. He's going to complete the work. He's doing it now. That's why things are so hot. He's come back to his temple as a purifier and a smelter of silver and gold. And things will be really hot in your life. If they're not, you better question your walk with God. You should be going through the greatest hard place you've ever walked in the whole time you've been a Christian. I don't care how long you've been one. I think the only ones that are maybe missing some of this are the ones that just got born again yesterday. But they won't have a honeymoon season as long as maybe we enjoyed one. Because you got to do a quick work, he said, in righteousness. Amen? So, let's go back and see what he says to us in Romans, the ninth chapter, verse 14. We're going to try to get through all these verses tonight. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> Romans 9, in verse 14, he says, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Talking about God making these statements before Esau was ever born. See, what we try to do is get to the human intellect and say, well, that baby hadn't done anything. Don't forget what we saw this morning. God has already ordained everything in our lives because he already knows exactly every choice that we are going to make. He's God. <laughs> Can you imagine? He's not a man. He's God. So he says, may that never be our attitude. See, God has already declared that his mercy is only for the repentant. Let me show you what he says in Jeremiah 31. <laughs> in Jeremiah 31, the Lord writes by his spirit, he says in the 17th verse. Jeremiah 31, verse 17. And you might say that this is... Uh, What's happening today, when a church like ours that began with seven people begin to draw people, I guarantee you, with the message we preach from these pulpits, you better know that God is in his house purifying his temple. Are you listening to me? This is what God is doing. He's telling us about how he returns to his temple and what he does to cause us to return from the land of the enemy if you remember what we looked at yesterday, you can put this also with Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, when God says, <laughs> I'm going to be king over you with wrath poured out. He becomes king over us through pouring out his wrath upon our lives, burning up everything of our flesh and everything that's not like him. He said, go ahead, everyone, serve your idols. He said, but later you shall return. He said, I'm going to make you pass under the rod. I'm going to force you into the bond of the covenant, he says. Did you understand that? I didn't sell out things just because we was in a hurry. But you remember when the shepherd had his flock. <laughs> he had a rod up there, didn't he? What did he do with it? What did he do with his sheep? Anybody remember? Huh? Broke your leg if you strayed off. Well, <laughs> <laughs> every lamb had to pass under that rod. And every tenth one, they put a big black X on it which means this one is devoted to destruction for the Lord's purposes. And God's putting big black X's on us. Mark those, he said in Ezekiel 9, who cry out over the abomination that's being done in this midst. Isaiah 4, he said, Thus says the Lord, seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, we will eat our own bread, we will wear our own clothes, we just will be called by your name. Ah, yeah. What do you find yourself doing these days? Are you praying more? If you're not, you better check your walk with God. Because the judgment that's sitting upon this earth and among God's kingdom should force you to your knees. God is saying, I'm going to burn up everything that remains of you. When I'm finished, only what I have placed in you shall remain. It's wonderful. We're being forced to pass under the rod of God. Amen? That's what he says to us. So God says in verse 17, he said, there's hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall return to their own territory. In other words, the time of us wandering and being wayward is over. 
There's not much grace left for those that continue to wander and stray. And they eat from this camp and they eat from that camp. God is beginning to tear the road. There's no more grace left. <laughs> He's saying, come back to your territory. The Bible says when he turned the fires, he forces us, forces us to go after what's really in us. He said the last days be difficult times. He'd be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, one of the lovers of God. Without affection, unloving, unmerciful, untrustworthy. What happened? The fires were turned up. I can show you what he said very clearly. When I heat them up, he says, they will growl like demons, he says. Oh yes, the fire is on. And the nature that's within us that's most dominant is not being revealed for all to see what's really in us. Remember reading all that? It's happening. I just wish you could hear me. It's happening. We're right in the middle of it. He's among us. He's caused it all. <laughs> there is no injustice with God, is there? May that never be. Look what he says. Oh, he says in verse 17, there's hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall return to their own territory. I have surely heard Ephraim grieving. Why do you use the word Ephraim there? Who was Ephraim? Second born. Hmm? Second born. Firstborn. His strength. Strength. The oldest is always the representative of God's strength. Heard him grieving. What is he grieving over? Look what he says. He's received the rod of correction. He says, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastened. I was chastised. Like an untrained calf. <laughs> oh, there's Hebrews speaking from Brother Paul. Those who the Lord loves, he disciplines. All discipline, he says, for the moment. Seem not to be joyous, but afterwards, he says, it yields a peaceful fruit of what? Righteousness or holiness. The Bible says he disciplines us that we may share in his holiness. In other words, he beats, quotation marks, the hell, quotation marks, out of us. What Satan has placed in us. He is beating us. We're being beaten to pieces. He's crushing us. It's wonderful, isn't it? The flesh says no. But those who have hearts for God are saying, pour it on, Lord. I'm giving my back to the smiters. And he says to the Lord, notice God has to do it, bring me back that I may be restored. For thou art the Lord my God. For after I turn back, that means you turn back to God, I repent it. And after I was instructed, I smote on my thigh. What does it mean when it says thigh? Spring, spring. The strongest part of your being is your thigh. Did you know that? What you're saying to God is, I'm breaking my strength. No more, Lord, wrestling against you. No more struggle against you. You see, like I said to you yesterday, last night, I told you, the name Israel, if you go right back to the real root meaning, means one who wrestles with God. God told Jacob before he changed his name to Israel. He said, Thou hast striven or wrestled with man and also with God, and thou hast prevailed. Remember what happened? That was some thigh action when that wrestling match was going over. Remember? The angel reached forth and touched his thigh, knocked his hip out of joint. And from then on, he walked as a spiritual cripple. And you, that's how you're going to walk. You're going to walk with a limp, saying, Lord, I can't walk straight. That's what I have you lead me and give me the support. And everybody that saw him walk from that day said, that man walks different than he used to walk. Hmm. Everybody knew it. The Bible says when God finished with a new day began, the sun was coming up. Yes, the sun of righteousness, he said, will rise with healing in his wing, and you will go forth like calves in a stall, he said. <laughs> Glory. So Ephraim is grieving. He said, Lord, 
I'm breaking my strength against you. No more resistance against you. Your will be done, Lord. Your will be done. No more lying. He says, after I was instructed, that's what's happening. We have the day of his instructions. Let me help you. This won't continue very long. This is only a short time of grace. He says, I smoked on my thigh. I was ashamed. And I was humiliated. Yes. Because I bore the reproach of my youth. And now God answers and he says, Is Ephraim, my dear son, is he a delightful child? Indeed, God says, as often as I have spoken against him, certainly, God says, I still remember him, therefore my heart yearns for him, and I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Now he tells us what we're to do while this is going on. He says, Set up for yourselves road marks. Place for yourselves guideposts. Road marks and guideposts is the hiding of God's word in our heart, the instruction, true instruction in our hearts, and we're walking in it and obeying it and practicing it. Those are the guideposts. He says in one place, within whose heart are the highways to Zion, the overcoming place, the place, where we soar like eagles, the place where we're seated with him on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I can't give you too much fat meat tonight on that subject. Mimic it more simplified. It's the place where we're far above all principality and power and rules of darkness of this world. And no longer are we governed by this world, this age, or this realm. We can truly say, our citizenship is in heaven. And no matter what we're going through or passing through or involved in the natural realm, it truly becomes an aspiration or a delusion or an illusion. You can see right through it. You know not it's a vapor, but it's all vanity. Oh, wait till you don't know what the word vanity means. <laughs> Hallelujah. Set up for yourselves road marks. Place for yourself guideposts. Direct your mind to the highway. That means the highway of holiness. The way by which you went. Return, O virgin of Israel. How can you return unless you once left it? Return to these your cities. How long will you go here and there, O faithless daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, a woman, circle woman, put a remnant, will will encompass, that means cling to, a man. His name is Jesus. How do we return? It's the ninth verse. God says, with weeping they shall come, and by supplication, that means you will find your innermost being, crying out to God, Lord, remember me. See, I watch those who have no prayer life. There's no cry of the Holy Spirit within their breast saying, Lord, remember me. Lord, restore me. Jesus has already said to us, it's by prayer he'll bring us up to his holy mountain. And his house will be called a house of prayer. I will make them joyful, he said, on my holy mountain. (laughs) God says in the ninth verse, with weeping they shall come by supplication. Seasons of prayer, groaning, crying out to God. Again, there's Isaiah 4. Again, there's Ezekiel 9. There's no other way for the women to be saved. There's Joel chapter 2. It's all there. It all adds up. If there is no prayer life, there is no strength given. If there's no crying out, there's no answer from heaven. God says, I will make them walk by streams of water on a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel 
And Ephraim is my which born? Firstborn. Are well, those words also in the Bible? <laughs> in Ezekiel. Oh, let me just show you this part. I'm not going to cut it short. <laughs> I don't think we'll get to the ninth chapter tonight, do you? <laughs> Who cares anymore? Amen, amen. You want to see what's going to happen when we rebuild? You know, my car has 139,000 miles on it. I remember when they rebuilt the motor. Rebuilt. It's as good as new again. You know, when God rebuilds us, we're going to be as good as new again. That's what he means when he says the latter house. Oh, would be greater than the former house. Oh, this tape just ain't long enough. That's what he meant when he said the latter house be greater than the former house. That's what he meant when he said, I'll make up the years that the locusts and the caterpillar, the palm worm, have eaten up. The latter house is us returning back to our first love. We remember what our lives are like when we get to walk with him. He said, when I make you the finished product, my completion of you will so outshine what you were when you began with me, when you were joyful. <laughs> Weeping endures for the night. Ah, oh, the time of darkness. But joy comes in the morning for the remnant. And God says in the fourth verse, Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. Again, he says, O virgin of Israel, Again, you shall take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards. On the hills of Samaria, the plants will plant and there enjoy them. For there shall be a day when watchmen on the hills of Ephraim shall call out, Arise! It is, wake up from your slumber. And let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. But thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chiefs of the nations, Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. And God says, Behold, I am bringing them from the north country. I will gather them from the remotest part of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame. That means you were spiritually blind. You didn't know how to walk. You weren't able. He says, The woman with child, and she was a label of child together, a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they shall come. And by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water. No straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. What well, can you say, man? Let me show it to you again. Go to Ezekiel 39. In Ezekiel 39. It's amazing what you can get out of two verses of the Romans in the See, Paul, revelation came to him out of the Old Testament. Everything that Paul wrote to us in the New Testament was the fruit, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Ezekiel says in the 21st verse, And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment which I have executed, and my hand which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I'm the Lord their God in the day only, and the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me, and I hid my face from them. So I gave them to the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword. First natural and spiritual, isn't it? We'll talk about that this morning. According to their uncleanliness, and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. Therefore, thus says Lord God, now, he says, I shall restore the fortunes of Jacob. Are you the house of Jacob? Talk to me. Does the Bible say that the remnant of the last days is the house of Jacob? Yes. Mm -hmm. I will have mercy on the whole house of Israel. I shall be jealous of my holy name. Oh, praise God for verse 26. And they shall forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they have per per 
perpetrated against me when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. When I bring them back from the peoples gathered from the lands of the enemies, and I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. God says in verse 28, Then they will know that I am the Lord their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations, and then gather them again to their own land, and I shall leave none of them there any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I shall have poured out my spirit in the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. <laughs> I better do it again for the night section. Go to Galatians 6. See what it says in verses 15 to 11. Paul says, for neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Creation. And those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. He tells you, the body of Christ is the Israel of God. Psalm 73 1 says, and this is what you turn there and sit for yourself. What does Psalm 73 1? The Bible tells us very clearly about who God is good to in Psalm 73 1. Jesus said, Only the pure in heart will see God. Is that right? Psalm 71 says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Let's watch Jacob come back to God through what David writes. Let's watch the influence of evil upon the people of God through what David writes. He says, But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. Did we see that Esau was arrogant in heart, living in a cleft of the rocks? I saw the prosperity of the wicked, and he said that God will call to the wicked territory, the people to whom God is indignant forever. Did we see that in Malachi 1? We're just showing to show you this. It all, it's the same message to our, almost every book of the Bible. There is no pains in their death. Their body is fat, which means... For you that don't know this, to have a fat body when this was written meant you were quite successful. You go to the Middle East, Japan, and China, they wouldn't hear from a skinny man, but they like to hear from fat people because they think they're successful. Coach, me and you ought to go there and have a revival, brother. <laughs> they're not in trouble as other men are. Nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. That means your authority. Necklace means authority, strength. The garment of violence covers them. Notice no robe of righteousness. Their eye bulges from fatness. Their, the imagination of their hearts run riot. They mock and speak, wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Folks that have a tongue that parades through the earth, you must have some type of tongue. And God talks about his people that return. In verse 10, he says, Therefore his people return to this place in waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, How does God know? Is there knowledge of the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Those whom God received as sons, he said, they're chastened. <laughs> you see what's happened to us? And I'm sure what's happened to us right now? In the body of Christ among the remnant. You know why the message of prosperity is not attracting our attention anymore? Because the Holy Ghost, somewhere set in your heart, a revelation that their end is going to be destruction, just like Obadiah prophesied. Let me show that's what David's talking about. David continues, he says, If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I should have betrayed the generation of thy children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Let me help you. The sanctuary of God is Jesus himself. And he says, then I perceive their end. 
And now we to see what happened to them. All these places of prosperity, wealth and fame and fortune. God places us in every place according to what's in our heart. Remember what Lot did? He looked around. And he selected a place that was beautiful. Lush. Looked like it had life. Didn't he? What was the ending of that place? Destruction. Look what David says. Surely thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou dost cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Remember your sheet on demon spirits? Did everybody get sheets on the symbols of demons? Is there anyone that doesn't have a sheet on demons? Brother Amos, can you make us some more sheets on demons? Thank you, brother. And I want you to notice that when this hits them, the judgment comes to those that have hearts like Esau. They are given no more chances to repent. It's all through the scriptures. It's here also. Look what it says. How they are destroyed in a moment. They're utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Did we learn that terrors all through the bottom means demons turn loose, running rampant in their full strength? Like a dream, and one awakes, O oh Lord, and arouse, thou will despise their form. Remember, I said to you that what we are practicing is shaping us and molding us into how we will be for all eternity. Remember the visions of Annie? How when she saw the wicked, she said, their form had so degenerated into such a hideous plant, they looked exactly like the demons. But then she said, I saw the remnant. And they were covered with beautiful jewels. Oh, the beautiful spirit of holiness. The beauty of it. Those things in you that's taking place, the Lord is purging us quickly. Some of us will outshine others of us, but in heaven, there's no one envious of how anyone looks. Because you see, in heaven, we are finished products like this bottle. It has no choice now but just be a bottle. Unless there's some more fire that hits it, it will always be this bottle. The fire will be over when we finish products. Weeping endures for the night. Ah, ah, the joy comes in the morning. When God is finished, we can't help but be a son. And we can still like the angels of old. The angels, we learn, don't understand sin. They can't comprehend it. There's nothing in this world that attracts them. And that's how we will be. O oh Lord, bring forth swiftly that day. Amen? Amen. Well, <coughs> let me get back on track. Go to Proverbs 28. All these rabbit trails. Thank God for these rabbit trails. Amen? Amen. Remind you, before I got on the rabbit trail, we were looking at the scripture verse verse 14. Is there any injustice with God? May it never be. We talked about who does God give mercy to? Mercy is only for the repentant. Now, remember the revelation that John gave us in 1 John 1 8 and 9? You confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Remember that revelation? He got that revelation from Proverbs 28 13. I want to show you it's not a contest of, well, Lord, I sin again, forgive me. We're just confessing my sins, he cleanses me. No, we're going to find out who gets the mercy. There's something that we have to do. 
God says in the 13th verse, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses, and what else does he do? Forsakes them. See, just confessing your sin is not enough. There's one other step. You would what? Forsake your sins. God says he will what? He will find compassion. And we talked before about the hardening of the heart this morning. And so because of that, I'm going to bring in verse 14. How blessed is the man who fears always. But he who hardens his heart will do what? Fall into calamity. Can you say amen to that? Amen. In Psalms 119, let's look again at who finds mercy and compassion. No, there's no injustice with God. Psalms 119. Remember what we saw this morning. <laughs> God knew everything we were going to do, but his ultimate desire was that all be saved. Can you say amen? Yeah. We saw that very clearly in 1 Timothy 2, verses 4 through 6. We also saw it also in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Is that right? We saw it in Titus 2, 11 and 12, and also John 3, 17. We are looking to see if there's any injustice with God. There's no injustice. He's like a parent who has prepared a, a wonderful table that's been spread. And he has said to us, everything on this table I have prepared for you while you're in this life. But I want you to love me of your own free will. You come and select what you desire to have. I don't know where we are in time. Hallelujah, who cares anymore? We're just putting this clock away. But I can't because it was a gift given to me. <laughs> Think about it. Whosoever will make come. And so we're like little spoiled brats saying, I don't like spinach, but spinach is good for you. I don't want it. God doesn't force you. It's later on you'll say, oh, how I wish I had eaten spinach too. It's a force us. No, there's no injustice with it. We will be in eternity forever what we have selected to be. And so we're in investigating to find out there's any injustice. No, there's none. In 119, what it says in verse 153. I, uh, I tried my best to chop this up, but I just couldn't, so I'm not going to worry about it tonight. We chopped a lot this morning, didn't we? And right before verse 153 is the Hebrew word rish, R-E-S-H. That one little tiny, tiny word translated into English is four English words. Five English words. Keeping God's law in adversity. See, adversity comes to test us. All pain and fires and adversity is fire. And gold is form and mold and shape and cast and fire. And let's see if this man, when sin and evil come against him, if he says, well, I might as well just quit and give up. No. Mm -hmm. Look upon my affliction and rescue me. Notice he's crying out to God. For I do not forget thy law. Plead my cause and do what to me? Redeem me. Revive me, which means I'm dead. Revive me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked. For they do not seek thy statutes. You wonder why they don't want to read the Bible? It's boring to them. They're the wicked. He told you that in Psalms 50, didn't he? What right God says to the wicked, do you have to take my cup in your mouth? For you hate discipline, he says, and you cast my words behind your back. God talks about the wicked and the word of God. He's not talking about the rotten slime, the son, and the straight. He's not talking about the crack salesman. He's talking about those who have the word of God at their disposal as Americans, as we all do. And yet, the word of God is that which is last on our list of priorities. But this world is first. Our pleasures are first. What we will is first. Let me help you. Salvation is far from those of that attitude. 
I don't care how much you speak in tongues, jump and shout. You can turn flips if you want to. Jesus said, how is you can hear my word? My word has no place in you. You're your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Did we see that this morning? Yeah. But see, when there's a one that's born of a spiritual birth, God says to Peter, desire the sincere milk of the word like newborn babes, that in respect of salvation you may grow thereby. I told you, salvation is not a one-time experience. It's an ongoing process through fire. And the one that endures to the end shall be saved. Can you say amen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, great. But that newborn babe, <coughs> when he does, he says, Oh, look what I found in the word. Oh, he'll say, My brother, my sister, I found this in the word. What does this mean? Ever saw little children? When they begin to grow, they talk at first, and they're always into everything, and then they go through those years of everything as questions. Well, why, Daddy? Why, mommy? And you find yourself just almost being drained answering their question. God is saying to us, drain me. Question me. Cry out to me. Bother me. But you can't bother it. He loves it. Oh, how wide his lap is. Jesus said, this generation it's like those of children who play in the marketplaces. And they cry and they say, we played music for you. Remember that? Yeah. They love to entertain their flesh. Children spiritually born of flesh. Love flesh, pursue flesh, give in to flesh. But the remnant of Israel is saying, Lord, remember me. Deliver me. Cut out of me the power of sin. Take out of me every desire of evil. Oh God, I'm so helpless. God knows it. Help me, God. I remember when God put me in the fire five years ago and turned the demon powers loose on me. I went everywhere trying to find out what is the secret of this narrow wall. I found men that thought they had answers and I used to bother them. And I discovered something. The secret is not with men. It's with God. And I'm telling you that fires mean nothing to me anymore. Because I'm finally under the secret. It's with God. That's what he says all the time. Plague my cause. Redeem me. Revive me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked. Why? Because of their selections, of their choice. For they do not seek thy statutes. Great are thy mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to thy ordinances. Let me help you. Give you some hope. The more you are finding yourself in prayer. And if you're praying the will of God, not yours, be done. What's God's will? Not one be lost. What Satan? What forgive me? What change me? What turn my heart? What bend my heart to righteousness? What turn my eyes away from evil and lust and vanity? What bend me to thy statutes and thy testimonies? Save me, revive me, help me. Answer me, deliver me. You'll make it. But that's one other part of the puzzle. You must turn away from all that is evil and wicked and of compromise. It's wonderful. Look what he says in verse 157. He can say a few. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries. But notice this. Yet I do not turn aside from my testimonies. I behold the treacherous and I loathe them because they do not keep thy word. 
Consider how I love thy precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. For some of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances is everlasting. Yeah, the table is spread. See, Mary, you might fight and wrestle for a while, honey, I can tell you because I went through cancer twice. Oh, oh cancer's a big lie. It's a delusion. What you're fighting in your body is an absolute lie. The word of God has stated. But you keep that word just flowing through you. You don't let trouble and strife flow through you. You tell the word. You forgive all your enemies. Number one, foremost. You bless those that have cursed you and wronged you. And you stand and say, Lord, I'm waiting on you, Lord. <laughs> You'll suffer a while. Now, if you suffer a while, the God of all grace will have come. And he himself, he says, will strengthen, confirm, perfect, and establish you. First Peter 5, is that right? Yeah. Well, is there injustice with God? Of course not. There's mercy with him for those that run to him. Why wasn't there mercy for Esau? Because Esau did everything he found out that his father and mother disapproved of. Parents said to Jacob, don't marry any of the women among the Canaanites. Go over to where we are from. Esau saw displeased his parents. He began to get every daughter he could find. The type and shadow. He did every lust and everything of this life that gave his flesh pleasure become a part of him. Let me tell you about the wives of Esau. Christian rock music. <laughs> Christian karate. Christian judo. Christian single clubs. Christian picnics. Shall I continue? Don't forget, Isaiah 22 has not been erased in your Bible. Don't forget that. But don't go over to have fun. They have fun is past. Go ahead, he said. Serve everyone your idols. But later you shall come back to me. You know why it's hurting right now what we're going through? Because I don't know if you know this. I'm going to tell you anyway. When you play with demons, they become ingrained in the walls and the linings of your being. Just like the angels of God are only around those that fear him. And are molding them and shaping them into the nature and character of the Father. The demon powers are also working. They're shaping those and molding them into the character of another father whose name is Satan. A deceiver, a liar, a thief. And one who has already been judged to destruction. That's why when Annie sold the finished products of the two camps, both of them came from the house of God that she saw. One of them reflected the beauty and the radiance of the Lord. The others were so disfigured, she said, I could not separate them and tell them apart from the demon powers. It was happening in the prosperity camp. If you don't see Moses, he hasn't returned. And there's a sound in the camp. Not one of war. Should be one of war, but it's not one of war. And there's revelry. And all kind of music and jumping and shouting and gaiety. The time of mourning. And the day is coming when God's going to turn the table. Well, let's go one more place. No, that's no injustice with God. Go to Isaiah 55. <laughs> oh, really, God. God says there, Ho! That's how it begins. Ho, he says. Everyone. Oh, there it is again. First Timothy 2, 4 through 6. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. There it is again. Everyone who thirsts, 
Oh, wait a minute. Thirst? What are we thirsting for? Righteousness. Righteousness. He that hunger and thirst for righteousness, he said, shall be filled. Did you know the house of Esau they were thirst for? Knowledge. Esau is a great Bible debater. Esau fills volumes of notebooks that thick from all the word conferences he goes to. In vain, he writes and says, the refining goes on. But the wicked is never separated and the Lord will call them rejected silver. Rejected. Salvation made void. Rejected. But yet the invitation is out there. Ho, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. You must come of your own free will. Let me tell you about the waters. They're found in Revelation 22. John looked and saw the same waters that Ezekiel saw. When you get ready to come to the waters, when you really get ready to come, and you're not one that's used to coming, you're one that's maybe used to being bound by religion and rules and steps and formulas and law, the same demon powers that Paul fought, you will fight. And they will do everything to discourage you from touching heaven. And I'm saying to you in Jesus' name, keep on standing and keep pressing forward toward the waters. Jesus will dispatch an angel to push you and see that you come safely through. Don't seek angels, but in a walk among the angels. They will see you safely through. Your flesh will feel the opposition, but what your flesh feel does not matter one iota. God has spoken. He says, come, buy and eat. You see, we can leave this now and go on a rabbit trail, but I won't do that. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all that's weak and heavy laden. That's who he's invited to the waters. The weak ones. Are you weak? You can come to the waters. No man can live without water. Well, you can go without food for a while. You can go over a month without food as long as you're drinking water. Did you know that? Talk to me. See, most are thirsty for this world, this realm. Esau thirsts for religion. He thirsts for Bible knowledge, but he doesn't thirst to have strength for war. Jesus says to us, to Isaiah, come, buy wine and milk. Wine meaning the spirit, milk meaning that which causes your bones to become strong. Did you know that babies drink milk? You know why babies drink milk? Because milk forms the structure, the bone structure. What's our foundation? The cornerstone Jesus, the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament. Desire, he said. Desire it. The sincere milk of the word, he said. Didn't he say <laughs> Why? That you may grow thereby in respect to salvation. Did you know that the house of Esau began with God? It's deformed, it's stunning. It's a camp of midgets. It never grew anymore. And God is seeing that they have their reward in full in this world. And the reward is this world. That they have already been devoted to destruction. God has already spoken. That is the outcome of the prosperity camp, 
and every preacher that would dare even put the word of prosperity from what this world their lips. Period. Explanation mark. Jesus says, Come by wine and milk without money and without cost. Oh, does the symbolism of the Old Testament throw you? He told you, money is a strength. Wisdom is also a strength. God is saying to us, don't use up your strength for that which is worthless. When he says without cost, because we know that salvation costs everything, it means nothing you can do to impress God. It's what he's already done. God says in verse 2, Why do you spend money? That means your strength. For what is not bread? You might want to remind yourself, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And all the knowledge you're getting that's not the word of God is straw and stubble. That's why I told you, after a service like Sunday night, I was going home and turn on my Christian TV stations so I could see through the darkness. It sharpens my, uh, it sharpens my discernment. Wasn't last night something else? I went home immediately. Mike and I said, let's see what's on Christian TV. Let's see what we can you know, detect. It was so obvious. I mean, so obvious. Their mouths were open. Words came out. It was all straw. There was nothing in any message I saw on TV last night, and we had both TVs on at once, checking it out, that was causing the people of God to be shaped and molded and conformed to godliness and the character of the Lamb. May God grant you discernment. <laughs> I think our clocks are too fast, aren't you? Amen. This is what the Lord says. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? The message of prosperity comes from the king of lust. The Lord tells us very clearly to make no provision for the flesh in accordance with this lust. Is that right? You know, when I was in a prosperity message, I was telling my sins, but now, oh, he brought me out, glory to God. I remember if a new stereo would come out, I'd buy it. And if another one came out next week, and I was already bothered by how can I get rid of this one because that one's a better one. I was never satisfied. Ever gone through that? You got a problem with lust if you have. Do like I did. Say, God, burn it out of me. Bring to that place, oh God, of 1 Timothy 6, having food and clothing, I can be satisfied. I told the woman today, I got enough suits in my closet to choke a horse. I told God I won't ever buy another suit until he comes. I don't care if they turn into rags. I wear rags if he preach. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possess. <laughs> sort of illusion. That's what he says. Jesus says, listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear, that means the ear of your heart. Come to me, listen, that you may live, and I will make an everlasting come with you, according, he says, to the faithful mercies shown to David. Well, can you use some of that mercy? Amen. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. What he says to us in verse 7. I'm sure in about four minutes, and I hope we can make it. Hebrews 8, verse 7. 
For if that first covenant had been flawless, that would not have been an occasion. So for a second. But finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And now which he said about the character of God, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Might want to put this up a footnote. After what days? After the days of the cross. I, God says, will put my laws into their minds. I, God says, will write them upon their hearts and I will be their God. They shall be my people. And they shall not have to teach everyone his fellow citizen, everyone his brother. I add the words have to. Saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me. From the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Is that also in your Bible? Amen. You find the very same thing in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Let's go to verse 16. God reveals to us there that he wants to be so merciful his throne is no longer considered to be a throne of judgment. Remember, they can even approach him on the mountains. Now, the table has been spread and everything the Father has has been offered to us at our disposal. All he's saying to us is, come to me and just help yourself. And God says, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace gave you a new definition of the word grace, add it to the other ones you know. Grace is God's ability ingrained in you by God, by His Spirit flowing out of you. That we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. When you find yourself in temptation, don't fight with the temptation. That's stupid. You're going to lose. Did you hear me? Talk to me. You don't fight with the temptation, you run to Jesus quick. Give me grace to overcome this temptation. You know why what Esau does? He fights with his temptations. The Bible says the Lord fights for you. Amen? Amen. What if I should even try it? Let's go back to Romans 9 and remind what we're looking at. Verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? No, may that never be gratitude. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Got a question for you. Who does God have mercy upon? Those who keep his commandments. Those who cry out for mercy. Those who confess their sins and forsakes them. Upon the repentant. That is who he has mercy upon. But he hardens those who harden their hearts and turn from him. How do you harden your heart? Lord, get me out of this. I'll serve you. He gets you out of it. And what do you do? You go right back to something else. It is so easy, so simple to harden your heart. See, we read over there in Exodus about Pharaoh. It said, when Pharaoh saw his relief, he hardened his heart. And I told you this morning, ignore that part and read it like it says without that. But Pharaoh saw his relief he did not what? Listen anymore. I mean, it happens continually. You're going to hear the phone calls we get. It's, it's an amazing thing to watch. I mean, I grieve over it. I always give them an answer because he says, the remnant of Israel will tell no lies. They will walk shoulder to shoulder. You see that? Let me see it. 
Okay. What is that about? Go to the third chapter. In fact, I'm going to bring this one in, but since you insisted, let me show sure you what's happening. God says in Zephaniah 3 8, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to the prey. Indeed, my decision to gather nations to assemble kingdoms, to pour out of them my indignation, all my burning anger. For all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. This earth is ablaze. Too bad you can't see it. For then I will give to the people purified lips. Purified lips means purified hearts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. That all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him how? Shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which means you're out of his presence. My worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. That means a, a pure life. And that day you'll feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones, as Esau. And you will never again be holy on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you an humble and lowly people. And they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. Nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed. That means they're on the word of God. And lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the king of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You will fear disaster no longer. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Don't be afraid, O Zion. Zion is a strong church, the overcoming church. Don't let your hands hang limp, which means I give up. Keep your hands raised to him. Oh Lord, remember me, Daddy. Pick me up. I surrender all. Help me. I praise you. Don't let your hands hang limp, he said. The Lord is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. Yes, I grieve when I watch these appointed feasts on these so-called Christian television. The junk that comes out of the mouth of a python. A flood. It came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on the behold. I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame. Gather the outcasts. And I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I'll bring you in. Glory to God. He's bringing us in. Hallelujah. Even at the time when I gather you together, indeed I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. What can you say amen? Esau and Jacob. <laughs> Two types of hearts in the body of Christ. But only the women shall be saved. Amen. God's grace be with you.